Oh, glad to see you're all still here. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> um, oh, I wanted to ask you: Are your parents recover? Have they recovered from the shock of seeing this film? Uh, they're still not talking to me. <laughs> <laughs> they have seen it, but they refuse to acknowledge it. They say. <laughs> so uh, but I, I would like to apologise for Steve McQueen. He's very sorry that he can't be here tonight. Um, but you know, directors, yeah. what can you do? Yeah. <laughs> well, I, as I was saying to everybody, I, I think this is. Personally, a, a masterpiece of study of the human condition, uh, and I, you know, it's it's so well. I want to talk tonight about all the different things that I think are have you know between you and Steve, you put things on their heads and do done things in a very different way from the traditional way of actually covering scenes and and uh, composing scenes and things like that. And what is very surprising is that you um, basically started as an ENG cameraman. You were a news gathering cameraman. And when you see this and the beauty of this, you think to yourself, how different every cameraman come, come from different backgrounds, how different everybody is uh, to reach this point. And maybe during the ENG times, you might have uh, it taught you to react with what was in front of you. Um, and I know that from that point, and you did 10 years of that, you went and became a documentary cameraman and then honed uh, your documentary skills, which is basically finding people in the light, finding, putting them in the places that you want them to come. And it's from that documentary time that Winterbottom picked, picked up on your photography and the way that you, do, that you did things. And you did Wonderland. And I'm doing all the talking here, but um, so what? So Wonderland was the first your break, really, wasn't it? Yes, very much so. And I think that you know I wouldn't be where I am now if I hadn't started where I did start. I mean, I've been shooting for over 30 years, um, and have had the opportunity in that time to do a bit of everything, and the experiences associated with that broad range of different types of production are complete they're, they're invaluable mm. um, but they all have everything you do has one defining core and that is storytelling and sometimes the stories are 30 seconds long sometimes they're an hour and a half long sometimes they're longer sometimes they're shorter but it really hones you down to storytelling and the first time i ever worked with steve mcqueen was one of those um one of those uh, just a little moment where everything changed i first started working with steve doing his art installation work steve is a is a fine artist who comes from the world of art and worked mainly in film art installations and i shot an installation with him down the deepest gold mine in the world in, in south africa called western deep and we arrived it took two hours to get to the bottom and when we got there, we'd been talking about it for months and months beforehand, and just talking and talking, and we got to the bottom in a, a truly hostile place, as hot as hot can be, with the roof falling down on you. It's just, you know, you don't really want to be there, and it's dark, and you know it's going to take you two hours to get up if anything goes wrong, so you're dead. If, and I turned to Steve and said, well, what do we do now? And he just said, I don't know. There's something here. Let's find it. And I could have slugged him because <laughs> it's like everything up to that point had been narrative. It had been linear. It had been sequential. It had, um, you always had a story to work from. But it was that suddenly realization that actually, you know, art actually isn't a story. It isn't a narrative. It doesn't start that way. It might become that. Um, but it, within 10 minutes of just looking and starting to film. These are just people with helmets with little lamps on yeah. it. You couldn't light anything. <laughs> There's no so you lighting. had to get reflections on their faces to yeah. capture whatever you might capture, might capture, not capture. Yeah. But it was freedom. It was absolute and total freedom, which was exhilarating. Um, and, you know, of all those years of work I'd done before that, we suddenly stood on their head. And it was a remarkable sort of revelation. And that is what has also contributed to make me the cameraman that I am. Absolutely. And you, you said that that moment, that fractured moment of saying, what the hell am I doing here, 
has changed your way of approaching storytelling and filming for presumably all the films that you've done since then? Absolutely. It informs everything. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, you know, you have to realize that as a cinematographer, that each story is different, each story is unique, each director is unique, mm. and how each story is told is unique. So you can't um, fix in your head your own style. Mm. You know, the idea is to get into the head of the director and to bring alive his interpretation mm. of, of the story and the script itself. And, um, you know, trying to get into the head of someone like Steve McQueen is a really interesting exercise in and of itself. Mm. Um, and I can't say that I would ever want to stay there for very long either. Um, but you, you sort of, you, you realize that, you know, there is an awful lot more freedom there around the story and around the script um, than, than most people will give you. Mm. And for me, what's very exciting, of course, coming from the sort of news and documentary background, is the unknown, it's the found. It's the, the things that you least expect that suddenly inform the story or the characters in a, in a way that no one ever expected. And that, you know, there's an awful lot of that in, in this film. Mm. And hopefully in a lot of the films. And it's very true. And I think that's a lot of his work is about the truth of the moment, of the story, of the characters. So just tell me a little bit about another installation that he did, just to get a bit of an idea of the way that he approached narratives of that one you described to me, which was basically a shot uh, on the back of somebody's head. Let me, you carry on. Well, one of the things about Steve is that he's, he's not informed and he's not driven by the, the normal um, compelling structures of filmmaking. Um, and you see that in, in his art films, and one in particular which I think has, has rather um, defined a lot of the approach um, to filmmaking that he is developing. I mean, he's developing and changing all the time. Is a, an installation he did, which was a simple photograph projected on large screen. And it is from above and behind someone. And we're never told who that person is we're looking at. Um, but as you're looking at it, there's a, a voiceover goes long. And it's um, a, a chap talking about how he accidentally killed, shot and killed his own brother. Um, and this narrative is so eloquently told. But all you have to look at is this single image. And by the end of those 20 odd minutes, you have sworn that the image has changed, that it has transformed, that it has moved, that you have seen things in it, that because of the story that you're being told, that the, this person in the photograph must be one of these people involved in the story. And it, it actually heightens the emotional impact of the story by giving you nothing else. And I think that's, that's something that, um, specifically in Hunger, um, that we, we, we've sort of looked upon a lot um, for those long takes. You know, it's, once you cut away, then you give the audience an excuse. It's no longer real, it becomes a film at that point. But if the shot carries on, then there is no escape. The audience, if they're engaged with the story and they're engaged with the characters, are drawn deeper and deeper into that scene by not cutting. And you know, there are several examples here as well in this film. And What's know, amazing, I think, is that you know, for somebody who is an artist but also a filmmaker what is amazing is that he has the balls to not cut has the balls you know you'd expect you know a producer to say oh how about a couple of close-up just in case you want to change the pacing yeah but from what i understand you know he would say no it works so what you're doing is you're absolutely the critical element of it is the performance. The performance, the actors, you have to trust the actors, they have, to, they have their speed, their pacing, and their, and, their, and, their, and their way of acting has to be absolutely perfect, because you're never cutting away, so it's got to be right. Mm. But of course, it's one shot for that one scene. I mean, even the restaurant scene here is just a little push forward, but basically they're sitting around the table and they're talking, and then behind the sofa, they're behind the sofa, and we're on the back of their heads, and we're basically focused on the back of their head during the whole scene. And that is a lot of, you know, 
more often than not, you're worried about the actors not being able to perform. So the choice of characters uh, and actors must be absolutely crucial for us. Uh, absolutely crucial. And I think that everything we do, everything we talk about, is about creating the space for the actors to, to work within. And although they are confined, for example, they can't leave the sofa on that shot. They're given the freedom within that frame to do whatever they want to a certain extent. There are script points that they need to meet. Do they ad lib? Uh, there are lots of elements of ad lib in that, yeah. I mean, but it is very tightly scripted. But the script is, you know, it's a touching, it's, 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 a, it's a guide um, as much as anything else. And a scene like that, we would do maybe 15 times. The dinner scene, we did 23 times. And so, and the actors would, would play with it and find a way and find... But you can only take one of the takes, one of those yeah. takes. You can't yeah. intercut, so, yeah. so that's one. Well, but then other ones, we, it would be first take, and that would be it. And I mean, that's um, Steve's... He, when he sees it, he knows when it's right. Mm. And if it's right, then that's it, move on. There's no point in doing it again. But what's extraordinary is the pacing of the whole film, because you can have scenes here, scenes there, scenes there, in one take. But then to have inside you the pacing of the whole film so that you can speed it up, and that's always the problem, isn't it? That's why everybody always covers things, because they want to speed up in certain places in the film. But he must have that locked into him. Um, I think it's quite the opposite. He is completely open to it all. He doesn't care about pacing. To him, that's that's irrelevant to to the performance, and to the look, to what's there. Pacing. I mean, we, we work with a fantastic editor, Joe Walker, and Joe's worried about pacing. Mm. Um, and they all are. They're all well, editors. Yeah. That's their job. It's their job to cut. You know, we've had quite heated discussions about scenes that have been cut up, but he's always right. At the end of the day, you know, I just. You talk about the editor, you're, uh, I'm, we're jumping ahead a little bit on my notes here, but um, the, uh, the editor, for instance, I was, just gonna, I was wondering whether, you know the scene where we jump time frames, when suddenly he's got beaten up, you're not quite sure why, and you go backwards and you find out he was in this bar, mm -hmm. and eventually he gets beaten up, and thing. was that scripted like that, or did that come out of editing? That, that came out of editing. It came out of editing, that's what, because the, the everything else, most of yeah. the film is linear. Yeah. And that's you suddenly think, oh, well, they're playing. It's beautifully done, too. Mm. But suddenly it's, it, it, it's a different, it's slightly different approach well, to editing. It, but it's, it actually occurs the beginning. Mm. The beginning plays with time as well. Mm -hmm. and, yes, that's right. And that, um, that section sort of harks back yes. to that. Yes, yes. Um, but, for example, the, 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 the scene in the bar with the girl was one continuous shot all mm. the way around the bar and all the way back around again. Mm. Um, which I was really proud of, and I hated it when he cut it. Um, but he's absolutely right in terms of, and this is where pacing comes in. And like I say, there's probably more to the editor. But again, when Steve sees it, he knows it's right. Mm. If it's not right, then he won't accept it. Mm. Mm. And, and that's, you know, it, it is, he's very um, decisive. But he's in a very complex mix, because he's very decisive, but at the same time, very open-minded. Mm. Um, about the performance, about um, the location. We talk and we talk and we talk about the, the script and the locations and, and what we think might happen before we get there. But once the actors are put into it, they of course bring their own thing. Mm. And so it's responding to the actors, the actors' performance in that location that then create mm. the, um, you know, the frames. Yeah. That, that I mean, so okay, within. talk a bit, a little bit about uh, um, at the prepping that you do and you know like the first image of him walking up and down naked uh, this is the wide you at what point do you get to that do you just get in the morning you said we want him to walk backwards and forwards but or it's it's pretty planned isn't it you've done a lot of photography yeah. you you shot a huge amount of that whole flat all different angles yeah I you know I, in the same way that that Steve is developing the way in which he works the whole time um, I'm hopefully developing the same. And for this film, I took a lot of stills on the location, spent a lot of time on the locations by myself, um, looking at different lighting states at you know, different times of day, and thinking about how these locations, you know, where the strengths are in the locations, and took a lot of stills 
um, which I then went through and put into the 240 aspect ratio and graded and presented to Steve as, as a series of images which we would just have running as we were talking. And they would then spark off ideas um, that would you know, inform the approach for when we got to the location on the day. Mm, mm. And, you know, and, the, and although it seems like he doesn't have many rules, uh, there are a few like you, you don't want to preempt the action. You want to, when, when Fassbinder comes into the, he hears some music in his flat, he comes into, the, into his flat, he picks up the, uh, the baseball bat and smashes into the, into the uh, bathroom. And we're discovering what he's discovering at the same time sort of thing. Is that something that is conscious? I think it's, it's so much in, in the way that the, the scripts are written. And Steve co-writes everything as well, and in this case with Abby Morgan. And the two of them, I think, had a fantastic interplay. Um, and, you know, a lot of the scenes are very, very true to the script itself. But it's always, always the camera reacting as opposed to the camera leading. Mm. Um, and so you create uh, the audience, in my mind, is much more interesting because the audience has, is, being, is being engaged the whole time. You have to follow the action. You have to follow it. You're not going to be told what's going on. Um, you have to work it out for yourself. And you work and instinctively, therefore. Yeah. You're completely so. instinctive, and every time it's slightly different or something else happens, yeah. and you have to, if you're handheld, you react to that, or if you're not, you know, you still react to it, yeah. and uh, through panning and everything like that. And, you know, he's, the, the sense that um, he loves to stretch time, you know, when Kerry Mulligan's singing, I mean, you couldn't have had New York, New York any slower than that. <laughs> But actually, it completely grips you because of that, isn't it? Well, and, you know, it also goes back to the, the truth thing. She can sing, and mm. she sang that song. That's a live recording. That's not ADR. That's not um, to playback. That's her singing the song. And in Steve's mind, why cut away when you have this person doing something really beautiful? Just look at it. Enjoy it. Revel in it. Mm. And he had, you know had researched the song itself and had discovered that it, that it really, you know, was incredibly mournful. Um, and this version of it really, I think, pulls out that pathos. Um, and I've never heard it so slow. I mean, it's, it's well, and it, it is extraordinary and it's just, mm. it's beautiful. Mm, and it the emotional response is, is very powerful as we see on, on Brandon. Mm. And, you know, originally there, there were going to be no cutaways. It was just going to be her singing. Um, but we, you know, we we did film um, Michael's reaction because as as she was singing, Steve had noticed that Michael was reacting. In a, in a, in he a did cry time. on yeah. set. I mean, that was well, amazing too. You know, at the time as I was filming it, I didn't even see the tear. I mean, it's to to you know, just to go on to a technical thing, to balance that interior with the exterior so that we didn't lose the light of New York outside. It was a very, very low light level. Mm, mm. Um, and, you know, looking through the, um, through the eyepiece, I, I, I never saw the tear mm. until we got into the grade. And then mm. I thought, whoa, mm. you know, that's actually quite something. Mm. And I mean, I've shot in New York as well in flats when, you know, there's glass all right. It's a nightmare in terms of reflections of you. Against the thing, but you, you, you know, you were never seen. You, know, you so work it really, out. Yeah, you work it out. Yeah. And the, I mean, the the two wonderful night steady cam shots, both one when he's running, where he goes complete to black, then he goes silhouette, then he's front lit, then he's back lit, and and, and the whole of New York is buzzing around. Uh, did you light any of it? And no. and the one when he's with Marianne. Uh, when they're walking yeah. up and down there where they go really silhouette, then they get completely black, then come out and they go to the tubes and so on. Did you, the, is there any of that lit? The, the running is completely unlit. Mm. I mean, that's weird. It looks beautiful. Yeah. Well, and why, the music why, why is so stunning. Yeah. I mean, that's the, the, the street was carefully chosen. We chose very carefully. It was 2.30 in the morning, so we had access. We could only afford to close off two cross streets. Otherwise, it would have just gone on and on and on forever. Mm. He wanted uh, Michael, this is sort of um, smack in the middle of Manhattan. He wanted him to get all the way to the river, mm. which is like 14 blocks. So you're lucky we didn't have enough money. 
otherwise we'd still be watching that shot because <laughs> Steve would never cut it. But at the end of the tracking shot of the him running, mm -hmm. the light goes, ee, 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 and so that was real, was it? Absolute luck. Oh wow, that's very good. <laughs> I wish I could claim it's what I wanted to happen, <laughs> um, and it did. I mean, I, I but it was. It was I thought, oh my god, you, you did a little bit of trickery there, but no. There I you wish go. I was that clever. <laughs> <laughs> so. Um, so that I think that the, the beautiful night shooting, very very well, the, lovely. The, the walking shots, there are lights there, just yeah. to let you know. I do actually light at night. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, <laughs> but even that's again, very subtle. We we made a, a very conscious effort. When people walk through the streets of New York, you walk in and out of light. You know that that is the experience that you will. Um, you just have to pick through. the area perfectly so that when they are out of light, there's silhouette behind. Yeah, you know, there's light behind. Or something. There's yeah, something, something. and there clever. always is in New York. Mm. You know, there is always, no matter what time of the day, it is the city that never sleeps, as they say, mm. there is always light to be had there, and it's a fantastic um, place because of it. Mm. Mm. So you uh, overcame the no-nos for all cameramen of, of shooting in a white uh, flat or white rooms. I mean, the whole of that flat was completely white, and it's always something that we usually don't, don't like. But again, put everything on its head. And you made it work brilliantly, and that's because of the f way it was facing. Well, the you know when you when you choose a location, you have to be very careful as how how you're going to use it and how you service it. Um, this location was on the thirty second floor, um, so how do you get lights outside? Um, the answer is you don't. Um, so then, how do you light it? You have to light it from the inside. So. You know, schedules being what they are, you need to find a building that that you can service at any time of day. And in this case, you know, I can't. If the sun comes out, comes pouring in, I can't put anything outside the windows because there's just no way to get there. So, you know, it had to be a north-facing flat so that the sun never came in, and that was the key to it all. Um, we could shoot. The light level would stay, even on an overcast day or a sunny day, the light level would stay almost exactly the same throughout the day itself. And you know that made it possible for that location to be used. There were a lot of other locations that we looked at that you know, we just simply couldn't do it on the schedule we had because the sun would come in at some what point was the and, schedule? and blow, blow, what was the schedule? Yeah, how, how many weeks? Five weeks. Whoa. Yeah. Incredible. So, you know, when you have only that limited amount of time, every decision you make in relation to the locations, you know, has to be with the, the schedule in mind so that you don't suddenly find yourself in a location that you can't film or that you're halfway through a scene and the light has changed and you can't do anything about it because that's death. You know, no one wants that. Mm. So, so you have to, you know, the, the pre-production work is, is fairly intensive. And then you also have to take a leap of faith that, um, that actually what you have seen mm. in your recce and the time that you're spent will actually be there still when you come back, um, which isn't always the case. Mm. But the, the single shot aspect of it, was that brought about due to the fact that you only had five weeks to shoot it? Or was it a style anyway that uh, Steve would have had anyway? It, it's very much a style. Yes. Yeah. No, it, it's um, Steve. I can remember very early on when we were um, talking about Hunger, um, which is a film we shot several years ago together. The he said because we were talking about coverage of scenes of dialogue, and he said, "Well, look, when I walk into a room, and I see two people speaking, I don't walk around the room and look at them from different angles." If I'm interested in what they're saying, I'll sit down and watch them and listen to them. And so to him, this whole thing of coverage just it didn't make any logical sense. Um, and again, you know, that combined with this idea of, of holding and holding the shot for the, for the performance to happen within it, to heighten the emotion of the performance, those two things together lead you to you know, creating um, long shots. Mm. Where I mean, the he told. goes up the, the the lift. He he thinks that there's something something's happened to his his sister, 
And that shot in the lift lasts for so long. And you're feeling with him, you're with him all the time. So you get, get to the flat, get to the flat, something's happened, definitely yeah. happened. So I agree, you know, it's extraordinary. It's, well, the it's, tension is extraordinary. It is the reality. That's how long mm. it takes to get to the 32nd floor. Mm. And once you put a dramatic context onto that, then it becomes something else. Mm. And it's that transformative element, which is what Steve does in his artwork as well. Mm. And I think it's what good art does. It transforms what we think is, is normal and shows it to be um, abnormal and emotionally charged in a unique way. Mm. You're very successful, very, very successful. So with your experience with Steve, has that, uh, uh, do you take that, uh, take that with you? I mean, presumably, obviously you do take that with you, but do you, does it, does it, is it seen in other directors' uh, films, or, or do you do different things for different, you know? You, you have to do different things for different yeah. people. Um, but some people will choose me to do a job because of what they've seen mm. me do. Mm. And they'll want me to do something like it again. That's what I'm thinking. I mean, are, are you but, chosen because of these films that you've done? I, yes. And, and the and style of this. You, you do have a choice whether you want to accept that or not. Because mm. when I did Wonderland, you know, which was my big break into, into drama, the first drama I'd ever really shot, mm. apart from a couple of, of, of short, you know, freebie shorts, um, everyone wanted me to do Wonderland again. So every script I was sent was Wonderland. Mm. And I didn't want to do Wonderland again. Mm. So, you know, I consciously turned down work because, you know, I didn't want to be known as the handheld, available light guy who comes in and just does real life. Mm. You know, I, I want to be a cinematographer. I want to, you know, I want to make lots of different films mm. with lots of different people. Mm. So, you know, but you can't help but take your experiences with you from film to film. And, and hopefully that's why people hire you. Mm. Not because of the specific things you've done, um, but because of the, the overall mm. sort of thing that you can bring to a film. Mm. And so um, you've got another film coming up with Steve. What's that and what's it about? Well, we're hoping to do a film called 12 Years a Slave, which is um, it's about slavery, um, based in America just before the Civil War, um, about a, a free man, a black man in the, the Northeast, who is tricked into slavery, and it takes him 12 years to, to regain his freedom. Um, and it is a fantastic script, um, very hard-hitting, it's going to be very controversial once again. Um, and it's sort of, it shows slavery in all its true horror, um, which I don't think you know, people are going to be very keen to see, but mm. it's just going to be very interesting. Your parents included. <laughs> <laughs> I'm from Texas. They're from Texas. It's going to be interesting. <laughs> and, uh, and is there a cast? Uh, is there a lead uh, for that? Of course, Michael Fassbender um, will be in it. As ever. But not as a slave, and presumably. Not as a slave. He'll be the nasty slave master. Yes. Um, uh, it's Brad Pitt is, is going to be in it, and he's the good guy. He wouldn't play the bad guy, um, funnily enough. Um, and Chiwetel um, oh, Adifal I'd love, yeah. is will be playing the lead. Which I'm just doing the film with now. Really? Yeah, no, yeah. Fantastic actor. Yeah. Brilliant. So Extraordinary. So, and, you know, we're looking, we're hoping for, you know, a large ensemble around, really? Those, really? around those characters. Steve doesn't do a lot of rehearsals, um, but he'll sit and he'll talk to the actors and, and talk through the um, talk quite a lot. And I'm not party to that at all, so I, I have no idea what they talk about. I mean, they might talk about the weather for all I know. Um, but it's um, once it gets onto the set, um, he then works with the actors. They walk through the scene, they talk through the scene. Um, quite often, I'm left as a little fly on the wall just watching that. And he gives the actors an awful lot of freedom to bring stuff in um, and to rehearse and to refine. And, but then if it's, going, if it's going in the right direction, then he lets them go and just you know, keeps careful tabs. If it's going in the wrong direction, he'll tell them. Um, so it's, and also he's, he's very, he's, he's fantastically um, inspirational, Steve, as well. He will get you to do things um, that no one would ever want to do. I mean, Nicole Barry did not want to take her top off 
um, but she did quite happily in the end. Um, he's very good at, um, at inspiring people. Um, and part of that is through the freedom he gives them and the feedback, the enthusiasm that he exhibits for their performance. Um, and, you know, different actors need to be treated in different ways, and he's very quick on picking that up. And to some, he's a very stern father. Um, and to others, he's a mate. And it's, you know, it's fascinating to watch. Well, it helps, for sure. And probably we wouldn't have ended up doing quite as long it takes, because it's just not physically possible. Um, but the initial idea of the two perf was simply financial. Hunger had a budget of 1.4 million. Um, and we wanted to shoot film. Shame had a, a budget of six million, which doesn't go very far in New York City. And again, we wanted to shoot film. Also, uh, you know, I love the, the 240 aspect ratio. Um, for me, you, you, there's so much more you can do in terms of composition. Um, and that naturally falls into the, the two perf. So, you know, I'm quite happy to sacrifice elements of, of um, you know, glossiness and em embrace the... Um, yeah, thank you. So, could I, you know, although there is a, an operator is credited, um, he sat in the truck all day. Um, you know, this is New York. That was a um, wonderful handheld. I mean, uh, the, you know, the, especially the ones where you go right down and so you come up, back up again. Yeah. No, the two, three, five. Bit helping you out. No, no, it's, <laughs> you know, it's very, you know, 30, very well 30 odd years of camera on your shoulder. Yeah, yeah. You would hope you'd kind of get very, good at something. Very, very done, beautifully so done. Over there, please. I, I am such a great fan of the Cook S4s. Um, I, there is something about them. They have a, a beautiful drop-off. They have a, a perceived softness, although they're very sharp. They, um, they, I just love the, the feel of them and the look of them. <laughs> I find some of the other lenses, are, the contrast is a bit too hard. The perception of sharpness because of that harder contrast. Um, I, I've, I, I, I just don't like in the same way. And also, I've, I've, you know, just about every film I've done, I've, you know, I've played with the Primos and I've played with the Ultra Primes and the Master Primes and you know, the, the old high speeds and everything that comes along, I play with it. But I tend to come back to the cooks. I, on all of the daytime exteriors, there's a polarizer, and um, almost invariably an indie of some sort. I'll tint, uh, on this film, um, we, we wanted a lot of drop off, so everything shot at 284. A lot of the nighttime interior exteriors all shot at T2. Um, and using the, I have to say, the, the Kodak Vision 3 500 tungsten. Um, and pushing that to a thousand ASA uh, is, you know, he did a fantastic yeah, yeah, job. Yeah, yeah. Ludovic Litty, um, you know, everything that I threw at him, he took it on. He's bold now, and <laughs> what's left is very grey. Um, but he, he, no, uh, and you can't you can't make a film like that without a crew who are willing to engage. Um, in this sort of filmmaking, mm. this was we, the way we made this is very different from the way people work in New York. Mm. Um, and initially, they thought we were absolutely barking mad because Steve is a rather eccentric character to begin with. And so, on the first day, we finished um, a couple of hours after lunch, and everyone had looked at the schedule and said, "Oh, we're never going to make the day." Um, and you know, it was like that every day because if it was done, it was done. There was no faffing about. And they embraced that. And by the end of it, they, they loved it. And a lot of them said, it's, you know, it is the most exciting film they've ever worked on because they were being challenged in, in different ways. Thank you. Thank you. No, there was a lot of indeeing. 
um, because although you know the light level stays uniform, it does go up and down throughout the day. And if you set yourself a stop that you want to work at, you have to be constantly assessing. If ever you're working with available light, um, you have to be constantly assessing it because it can so easily go up a stop and a half without you noticing or drop a stop and a half or two stops without you noticing. So you're always looking at it, always playing with the filters before each take. You know, the meter's out, you're assessing your relative values of exposure throughout the, throughout the set and then making a call as to what, you know, what, what glass you then put in front. But there was also, you know, the, when you're working in white rooms, you have to be very careful about um, how much light you, you yourself put in because it's so easy for... It just bounces because It just bounces everywhere and everything goes flat. So a lot of the, the, the lighting units we were using were very small and very controlled. Um, so uh, or otherwise, you know, you're trying to maintain... I mean, I, I have to say this, this wasn't a bad projection, um, but the contrasts are completely out because we're projecting onto a silver screen um, as opposed to a standard uh, screen, which is what we graded to. So, you know, this was all just a little bit thin um, when it came to the contrast for a lot of it. Um, and, you know, I think this is, a, this is a, an issue which as cinematographers we all have to address now because we're grading our films to be projected in one way, and yet once they go out, they're being projected onto something else. If I hadn't asked them to turn down the projector by 50%, the whole of the film would have been a stop and a half overexposed. Um, as it is, it still looks a bit thin. The silver, the silver screens don't have the same contrast, and they also don't do exactly the same things with the color. So, mm. you know, and there are more and more silver screens around. So, what for? Yeah. 3D. Who wants 3D? <laughs> well, well I'd like uh, to thank Sean Bobbitt for a fascinating and beautiful film. Thank, thank you, you very much, much indeed. Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you.